So uh, I, I don't know, has anyone had the LD50 yet for wrist fractures, or is it even possible? Um, but I think it's, it's one of the most common things that we see and one of the most common things that we operate on. And I think we need to have these things in mind. Some of it goes back to the keynote I, that I spoke about yesterday about close reduction. I obviously feel very strongly about that. And then the question is, when do you operate in terms of internal versus external and combinations and what types of fractures or fracture patterns would be most amenable to that? And again, if you only remember one thing from this talk, just don't know uh, one single approach, just this concept that one single approach is going to fix all the wrist fractures is flawed from the outset. You can't do it that way. You can't do everything with a bowler locking plate. So learn some other things. Think about some other things. Is this the one? Yeah. This is it? Those are my disclosures. So, is, am I moving this thing when I do this? Right, right click. Yeah, so look at this case. You want to put a volar locking plate on that? You got like a little tiny fragment, minuscule fragment of bone. This is a fracture dislocation. This is primarily a ligament injury with a little piece of bone attached. The volar intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments are disrupted here. So if you only know how to put a volar plate on, what are you going to do with this one? The plate will be nowhere near this fragment. There's no way to get screws into it. And it's just not going to work. So you can get into fragment specific and all kinds of little uh, adaptions. But basically, you have to have some other strategies to fix something like this. And I talked to you about the practice guidelines. This is actually the Academy guidelines. And the only thing that has a little bit of evidence, and it's not you know, maximum evidence, they call it you know, good evidence, not great evidence, is these parameters that I talked about yesterday. And again, hammer this. This is, the, this is for your in-training exam. And when you're for your, doing your board exams, this is what they're going to ask you. Less than four millimeters of shortening less than 10 degrees of dorsal tilt, and a step off of less than two millimeters. Those are the answers. And I talked to you about yesterday about what I thought was most important was the distal radial ulnar congruence. So close reduction, everybody gets one. If you meet those parameters and the DRUJ is congruent, you can go closed and get a good result. Now what about if you can't do that? So when would you do spanning external fixation? And it's a great technique just for that case I just showed you, that little periarticular shear fracture. That's a perfect one for a spanning X-fix or a spanning plate. It stabilizes the carpus. Yes, there's an open component to it. It may be sutures. It may be K-wires. It may be a mini plate. It may be something like that. But you have to be able to put an external fixator on or a spanning plate on. And obviously, if you have gunshot wounds, you do have gunshot wounds in Philadelphia, right? Uh, so uh, you have bone loss, you have infection, you have soft tissue injury. You've got to be able to put X fixes on. So X fixes need to be put on with limited open technique to not bugger up the radial sensory nerves. And so I make little incisions and make sure I'm down on the bone. And the bones are small. If you drill eccentrically in the metacarpal or the radial shaft, you can get a stress fracture. And there's absolutely no reason for that. So, but when I do X-fix, I never do just X-fix. There's always augmentation. And what is that augmentation? It's usually Kirshner wires placed in various uh, different trajectories, Kapanji type pins that are in the fracture site itself, or else transradial styloid pins are down the shaft, sometimes with bone graft, um, but something other than an X-fix alone. X-fix alone won't do it. So we did looked up some meta-analyses. These are papers that we wrote. And basically, if you do a good reduction, there's no difference in the outcome. 
And this has been said over and over and over again. So there's nothing special about a, about a volar locking plate. What is special is about getting a reduction. So if you get a good reduction, you have the same outcome. Now the only differences were, we saw it's trending to better strength in X-Fix, believe it or not, less dissection, better power. But we saw a little bit better supination with plating because when you push with a plate on the volar or dorsal facet and reconstitute the DRUJ, you get better concavity, better curvature, better rotation. So that gets back to what I said yesterday in the keynote. Um, and again, the volar tilt is a little bit better with a plate, better manipulation. But you can do the same thing with an X-Fix, but you have to use joystick K-wires and you have to manipulate. You just can't pull. Pulling alone won't do it. And so we wrote, a, I, I referred to this yesterday, but this is a randomized trial comparing volar plating to um, external fixation to radial column plating for the same types of fractures, not cherry picking the fracture. The same types of fractures treated with different techniques and the outcomes were the same. And what was important is what I just said, quality of reduction. Good reduction, good outcome. Bad reduction, bad outcome. Plate, X-Fix, whatever you do. And so you can't you know, forget all these other principles. So here's some cases. This is a patient with a displaced fracture. Close reduction, inadequate, based on the criteria I showed you at the beginning. And so what do you want to do with it? In this day and age, 2017, everything's a volar locking plate. Everything is a volar locking plate. But this one is not, this case wasn't done that way. This case was done with augmented external fixation. So multiple K wires manipulating fragments, percutaneous, and a spanning X fix without too much traction, just a neutralization frame. And you can move the fingers even with the frame on. If you don't over distract, you can move them. So here's somebody making a fist. You can actually do forearm rotation. You can do a lot of things with a frame on. And that's what it looks like at a month. There's not gonna be subsidence because you've got a neutralization frame on. Pins don't back out, everything stays put. And there it heals. It's as good as any volar locking plate you can put on. And you never have to take it off and no screws are in the way. And that's the outcome. Got full supination, got a smiley face. Another patient, another fracture, and this one is a lunate facet displacement, impaction. It's not acceptable. Close reduction, not acceptable. More than two millimeters a step off. It's an articular facet. It's involving the DRUJ. This is a no-no. And so you could put a volar locking plate on, or you could do an external fixator. Manipulate the lunate facet with K wires, put a spanning X fix on. People have forgotten how to do this. It's really incredible to me. There it is in a month, nothing moves, nothing changes. Finger motion's great. There's the outcome. Just as good as any volar locking plate you've ever seen. Here's a patient. Bad one, very comminuted, bone's not so good. I don't know if you want to put a volar locking plate on that. Look at how many little pieces there are and how distal it is. What are you going to do with this if you don't have another technique? So don't forget the external fixation spanning types of treatment. There's a close reduction, very unstable, bone is poor. Never going to hold in a cast. Was put in an external fixator with augmentation. If you ever see an X-Fix on with no K-wires, it's not going to work. They always subside and it's not going to work. So you've got to always have something else with it. So look pretty good. X-Fix is on. K-wires still in at two weeks. There it is at a month. Looks good, just like all the other cases I showed you. 
And there it is, ready for removal at two months. You don't need to keep these on for more than two months. But at four months, this thing had fallen apart. So the fracture did not heal. It was never opened. Perhaps it was over-distracted. Perhaps she has a bone metabolic disease, vitamin D deficient, kidney disease, something, because it's quite rare to have, without infection, to have a non-union. So not, they don't all do well. And then it went on to a pseudoarthrosis. She had a lot of medical comorbidities. She was just living with this. But it's unstable. Not, not Forget about the cosmesis of it. It's unstable and weak and painful. But she lived with it for two years. And so when you think that it, an older person can just deal with whatever they have to deal with, sometimes that's not true. So when you look at this and you'd say, do I have to fuse this wrist? And that's the first thought that I would have in my mind. This should just be a wrist fusion and be done with it. But the articular surfaces actually were still relatively well aligned. It was just the metaphysis had collapsed and had basically dissolved. So that's what it looks like. And again, not very comfortable. So CT scan to see what you're dealing with, but the articular block looks reasonable. A lot of bone loss and obviously a full pseudoarthrosis. But the question was, does it have to be a wrist fusion or not? So in this case, and in, in many of these cases, if I think the joint's still good and she needs some wrist motion, we put a spanning plate on. So this is one step beyond a spanning X-fix. And it goes, when you can't fix a small articular fragment, but you can bone graft behind it, you can then span it with a plate. And it prevents collapse and allows the thing to heal and then you can always come back and take the plate off and allow for motion. So it's a good salvage procedure, and it's a good procedure when you don't think you can capture a lunate facet um, with a volar locking plate. And you're in the middle of a volar locking plate case, and you say, I don't have it, I can't get it, and I'm going to put a, a spanning uh, dorsal plate on, and I'm going to leave it temporarily, and it's going to hold my position hold my carpal translation, and then I'm going to go retrieve it. So it's a great salvage procedure, and a lot of companies will put a dorsal spanning plate in their kit to have it as an option. So that's what she had, and it went on to heal with the joint being maintained. So this is not a wrist fusion. And then the plate came off, and she still has functional radiocarpal motion and was very satisfied. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind, along with X-fix and spanning plates. There's another patient who fell, displaced fracture, working guy, looked like it needed something, and so everything looks like a volar locking plate. So this was done by an expert. Plate was put on, you can see it looks good, and there was a big void in the back, they actually even grafted the void because they thought it was too unstable. And the patient was put in a splint. And the first post-op visit after that operation that looked very good, first post-op visit looked like that. At two weeks with a splint on, the whole thing collapsed. Now why? Because when you have poor bone and thin cortices, and you put a volar locking plate on, you may not capture the dorsal facet. And if you don't capture it, the thing just sinks. So, and that was in spite of the fact that the surgeon put a bone graft in there. So this one would have been one that could have been, had a dorsal spanning plate or a spanning X-fix. So there's no loss of ego if you do a volar locking plate and you're not sure you have stability, is to go ahead and put a spanning X-fix on for three or four weeks. There's no loss of ego to do that. And so here are the options for this guy. He's only two weeks out. And by the time I saw him, it was four weeks out. Go back to the Palmer side, do it again. Think you're better than the first surgeon. Think you can do it all from the Palmer side. Or go to the dorsum. 
where the real problem is, and then how do you protect it? So the volar plate was left in, some screws were taken out so that the dorsum could be manipulated. It was grafted again, a dorsal a facet plate was applied, and the two plates were married. The screw from the volar side actually went into the dorsal plate, and then a spanning X fix. So this is how you can salvage these patients, and sometimes this is what needs to be done primarily if you recognize the fact that you don't have stability. But this went on to heal. The fixator can come off early when you have a dorsal plate, and there's a stable construct. Another patient, this is a dorsal injury, you can see it. I keep showing you these because when you try to fix them from the volar side and you have a primarily dorsal injury, there's no access even. This volar cortex is intact. You never put a volar locking plate on this patient. You wouldn't be able to see the fracture. This one needs a dorsal approach. So you got to learn the dorsal approach. And this was had a dorsal facet plate. And that's all it had. No X fix, no volar locking plate, and it was stable, and the patient had an excellent outcome. So go, like they said, go where the money is. Go where the displacement is. Go where the comminution is. And don't get stuck by doing just molar locking plates. So again, close reduction is still my number one go-to thing if I can maintain it in a satisfactory way. The DRUJ is everything. We're still going to use mainly volar locking plates because most of them can be done that way. Fragment specific when you need to. I love radial column plates and dorsal facet plates. Get comfortable with them. And never forget about putting a spanner on, whether it be a plate or an external fixator. Thanks very much.